Vogue, given what we call big data and also the uh, goal to uh, describe complex physical phenomena. And I'm going to be interested in two uh, particular applications during this talk that motivate me. One is, there it is, directed learning where you want to query a high dimensional function in order to understand it or to recover it or to predict what a sample would be, the value of a sample would be. And the other will be at the end of the talk, mainly parametric stochastic PDEs. Now you can formulate, uh, if, if you want a, a formulation that encompasses everything that I'm going to talk about, it would be the following. I have a function, it's mapping 0, 1, D into a Banach space. And here capital D, the, the important thing is capital D is large. In fact, for stochastic PDEs, uh, capital D is infinity. So that's real large. That's bigger than John Benedetto's salary. But <laughs> <laughs> and so the problem we want to attack is, okay, we, we would like this, we're, we're allowed to sample F. Maybe we're given a budget of so many samples we can take of F. And we want to understand where should we sample it and how well can we recover F from these samples? That is, can we construct an approximation to F that's, that's accurate from these samples? So that's the general problem that I want to look at. So when you start this problem, the first thing you have to negotiate is this something called the curse of dimensionality, which I have one slide to explain. And what this curse tells you is that what you've been doing for you know the last 50 years will not work. Uh, if you think about classical uh, sampling, for example, uniform sampling or even an adaptive sampling, uh, this is not going to work. Think about uniform sampling if you sample the function uh, which lives on 0, 1, D and you use L to the D samples, that's just giving you resolution 1 over L, then for a typical uh, function that's smooth, uh, this will not be very accurate. And I'll get to that here in, in, in just a moment. So uh, what, what uh, cursive dimensionality says is that if you use n computations and all you know about your function f is that it's smooth, say it has s derivatives, then the best accuracy you're going to get in recovering the function is n to the minus s over d. So when d is very large, you're going to have a very poor uh, resolution of your underlying function. That's the curse of dimensionality. The fact that this d appears here in the denominator, and when you look at the accuracy, so that you need a lot of smoothness for the function in order to recover it well. And if D is infinite, of course, I don't know what this says, but it says that you can't do anything. Now, to, to drive home this example, or this curse, I, I just mentioned to you one example here, which I think is very illustrative of what's going on. Let's suppose I'm on 0, 1, D, and I give you that my function F is so nice that it has all the derivatives you want, infinitely differentiable. Not only that, all the derivatives are bounded by 1. So this is a real nice function. Now if you go to recover this function, and if you take 2 to the d over 2 samples, okay, you won't be able to recover this function to any accuracy better than a half. That'll be the accuracy that you'll be able to do when you try to recover it. It follows from this result. So for example, if d is uh, 100, by taking 2 to the 50 samples, that's 10 to the 15, roughly, samples, you're only going to get accuracy a half. So you see, you're, you're, you're in a mess. You're not going to get out of this. So the classical idea, the way we think about functions in terms of smoothness, we think a function is nice if it's differentiable, this doesn't apply here. It doesn't work. We need some new ideas. 
Now, fortunately, conventional thinking is that the real world problems we're trying to solve can actually be solved. There is a way, we just have to find a way. So these functions would be recoverable. So what does this mean? This means that our classical model, to model a function by its smoothness, is not the right idea. We have to enter some other ideas or some other ways of quantifying what nice functions are. And there are many of these, and you're probably familiar with uh, some of these notions. One notion is that the function can be written in terms of a basis or frame or dictionary and it has a few terms in it. This is called sparsity. Maybe a more meaningful one is compressibility where it can be written as a sum of things with the coefficients decaying at a certain rate. Another uh, notion that comes up all the time is that even though it depends on all these variables, the variables are not democratic. Some variables are more important than others. Maybe that it, the dependence on some of the variables is very weak and you can sort of kick them out and not have to worry about them. Reducing the dimensionality of the problem. <coughs> There's a zillion different areas that have emerged based on these ideas. And I mentioned some of these. Sparse grid, sensitivity analysis, variable reduction, tensor formats, all of these are an attempt to put another structure on functions, not just smoothness, but another structure which will then make the problem of recovering the function in high dimensions more amenable to, to us, more attackable, okay? And what I want to uh, do in this talk is to understand, okay, given that we impose such an, uh, a structure, some structure like this, okay, that's great. Now we think that the problem could be solved, but where should we sample the function? <coughs> where should we take the samples? So I'm going to begin uh, first, and I'm uh, by talking about the case where the function is just mapped into the real numbers. Okay, not to a general Banach space. Later I'll talk about a general Banach space. But for now, think of just a function, the, the case where I have a function defined on 0, 1, d, d is large, taking real values, and I want to recover it, and I impose one of these ideas that's floating around, like variable reduction, or tensor format, or sparsity, or this or that. Okay, where, what does that tell me? about the function, where should I sample to recover the function? Okay, then we'll turn to the Banach space case. I'm interested in the Banach space case mainly in the context of <coughs> parametric and stochastic uh, PDEs and, and uh, we'll discuss where you should, in this case the function f is the solution map. You have for each parameter you have a solution to a PDE and a function f maps the parameter into the solution which lives in some Banach space. So we'll get to that in a moment. You don't have to absorb it all right now. Okay, Th this uh, method of trying to reduce the dimensionality or solve these high dimensional parametric problems is called the reduced basis me method or sometimes called reduced modeling. It has different forms and I'll get to that. All right, so let's begin with the idea of variable reduction. So when I look and I see in a lot of uh, areas, statistics in different areas, people talk about variable reduction, but I don't see a real analytical quantification of what variable reduction means. I mean, the general principle is that the function depends strongly on a few variables and more weakly on other variables, but what's, uh, give me an analytic description of what you mean, because if I want to prove a theorem that tells me the accuracy that I'll be able to recover the function in terms of the number of samples, I need some concrete analytical description of the class of functions you're looking at. So, <clears throat> part of the game is to introduce a specific model and then study that model and I, I throw out for you here the model that we're sort of 
imposing and trying to understand variable reduction in this context. This is what we'll mean by variable reduction and see what we can say. So here's my uh, model for variable reduction is that my function f, which is a function on 0, 1, d, actually is a composition of two functions, g of phi, and the, uh, the function g is smooth, and the smoothness will tell me somehow the accuracy I'll be able to recover by, and the function phi has the dimensional reduction, right? Because phi maps capital RD into little rd. So even though my function looks like it depends on capital D variables, in reality it somehow only depends on little d variables, but that's hidden in this composition. So this is like Komogorov's what, 13th problem, superposition of functions, and this is something that could be thought of as a part of the model for that. Okay, so that's sort of the setting. And a simple case of this would be when the function phi is just a matrix, so just a linear function given by a little d by capital D matrix. So we've been studying this and what I want to do is to present to you only the simplest case of this so that you can understand the principle and then you can look at papers to see how far this general principle can be uh, taken. So what I'm going to do is actually concentrate on this very simple case where my function of d variables is actually ostensibly a function of little d variables, but I don't know which variables. So I give you a function of 100 variables, and I say it really only depends on two, but I don't tell you which two. And I ask you now, start sampling. So your job will be you'll sample, and you're going to try to find these two variables yet, right, where it's changing, and then once you find them, you'll know how to recover. But the question is, can you do this in an economical way without wasting a lot of samples? And the key is to keep the number of samples down for the given accuracy. Okay, uh, so let's look at this problem. So we have a function that depends on little d variables. Now, if we actually knew the variables, what would we do? Let's say it depended on two variables. We would just take the two coordinate, the space of two coordinates, the variables it depends on, and we would sample uniformly in these two coordinates. So this is d equals 2. And if we took L squared samples, we'd have resolution 1 over L. And, and this would be good if we had a, a function in CS. It would be recovered to accuracy little n to the minus s over 2. The curse of dimensionality would be the little d, not the capital D, right? So that's a big gain. But of course, the problem I have here is I don't know which two variables or little d variables the function depends on. So can I sample in such a way that as I do the sampling, I'll figure out which variables it depends on and therefore recover the function. Now you can imagine that even if the function depended on more than two variables but weakly on the others, then maybe some technique like I'm going to tell you will work, right? And it does. I mean, there are versions. But I'm keeping my life simple here. So it actually just depends on little d variables. Okay, so if we knew the variables, this is what would happen. If we took n samples, we would get accuracy n to the minus s over d if our function had smoothness in cs, let's say, s times differentiable, right? So the curse of dimensionality here is just to divide by little d, okay? But this would require us to achieve this. We would have to know which little d, which variables it depended on. All right, so. Now, we don't know these variables, so what are we going to do? What we would like, and so this is the first principle, I'm trying to give a, out a principle, where do you sample the function? The first principle is that you're going to create a cloud of points in capital D space dimension, right? That's very big, think of a big box. And you're going to put points there. Think of them like little stars. And what you want of this point cloud 
is that if you projected it onto, let's say little d was 2, you project it onto any two-dimensional space, so that you get this, then you would get a uniform sample here. Okay, so that's the problem. So you can think about that. You can sit, you know, by yourself, scratch your head and say, how would I arrange a constellation of points such that when I project it onto any two-dimensional space, so my enemy comes along, I, I create the, the collection of points P, and my enemy comes along and picks J1 through JD, and I project that onto his D dimension, little d dimensional space, I should get this uniform grid. Okay, so can you do it, and you know, how, how, how would you do it? And the naive approach would be just, well, I'll just take for every d dimensional space, I'll take such a cloud of points, and then I'll union them all up. Well, that's pretty stupid, but <laughs> <laughs> what it would do, it would give you quite a few points. It gives you L to the D, that you're necessarily going to have, but it's multiplied by this factorial, and you see if, or this combinatorial coefficient, and you see if capital D is large, this is enormous, and so you get really an obscene estimate. Now what it turns out is if you start thinking and saying, can I do better than this? It turns out, yes, you can do better. Not only can you do better, what will happen is that the number of points you're going to have to take in order to get this projection property is going to be of the order, no longer of this order, but that fact, that combinatorial coefficient gets reduced to log of capital D. So log of capital D is much more reasonable, right? If your D capital D is 100, you have log of capital D, of four, uh, 2 in base 10, but whatever it is, okay? So it's, it's small, right? Okay, but now how do you get such a configuration of points? Uh, so the way you do that is you do something called perfect hashing, and I don't want to get into describing what perfect hashing is if you don't know it, because I have a lot of topics to talk about, but it's just something that Eitan should be writing in his little, you know, computer that he carries around. Perfect hashing. This is something that will reduce dimensionality and do it in a very economical way so every D dimensions is handled sort of democratically. Okay, so that's all I want to say is that there is a configuration. It's very small cardinality. It has to have this projection property. You get it by something called perfect hashing. And you, you will need to read about it. Now you can use this to, to actually give an algorithm for sampling functions. So if you have functions, I take now a model that my function is the depends on little d variables and my function capital F is CS, it has S derivatives. Then what you can show is that if you take this number of samples, so you're going to use this configuration, this constellation that I get from perfect hashing. So I'm in capital D dimensions, right, and I have these, this star of points, this constellation of points, and I just simply ask for the value of F at each of those points. So that'll be log of D times N. But now I have the problem, as you always do in these subjects, of sorting out all these values, looking at all these values, can I figure out what variables it depends on, and then create an approximation. And that's a substantial problem. If you think in the field of compressed sensing that everybody's interested in, you know the decoding part, the compressed sensing is easy, making the measurements, the decoding is the hard part. Here the same thing is going on. It's easy to make the measurements, but to decode is, is difficult. But nevertheless, there's an algorithm that does it. And so we get this performance. And so uh, comparing to what I, we first did, uh, before we had n samples and got that accuracy, but we knew the, the change variables. Now we don't know the change variables. This is the cost. We have to take a few more samples, but we get the same accuracy. Okay, so that's the first illustration of sampling in high dimensions. You have to do something clever in terms of 
positioning the point you're going to do sampling at, and that cleverness is through perfect hashing. I mentioned a second theorem here is that if you applied the same algorithm to the case and it turned out, you know, you would be lucky. Let's say you're working on a real world problem. You don't know if the function depends on d variables. You don't know whether it's in CS. You don't know anything, right? You just have a function and you start sampling. Well, this sort of says, well, if it turns out that the function is not a function of little d variables, it's still okay as long as it's close to a function which depends on d variables. So if the other variables are weak, don't influence much the function, this will still work. Okay, so that's the, the bottom line there. Okay, the next uh, simple example, and one I want to bring out because we don't know too much about this example, amazingly. So, you know, in quantum chemistry and all these things, Fokker Planck equations, everybody is using tensor formats, thinking this is a way to numerically solve these equations and reduce <laughs> the dimensionality in, in, in these situations. So, this is a natural class of functions, functions that are, that are tensors. Let's begin with the, the simplest case of rank one tensors. So let's suppose that our function f, it depends on d variables, but it turns out it can be factored into this product of f1 through fd, capital D, these functions of one variable. So if I give you this model class, you think the following. Here's the way we think, right? We think, well, we, we need to have n samples we can recover this to accuracy n to the minus s, right? If the function little f1 is in cs, it's a one variable problem. You just sample equally, right? And if you sample at spacing 1 over n, you'll get accuracy 1 over n to the s. You take, for example, piecewise polynomials as an interpolant and, and achieve that. Now, so this actually uh, you would be able to do this, so, so you'd like to sort of recover F1 separately, F2 separately, FD separately, and then take the pro product of your approximations and get your approximation to, to F. So let's say, you, you, so now you start sampling. If you find a point X bar, so you make a sample, you say, okay, I want the value of capital F at a point X bar. If it turns out that capital F at X bar is non-zero, you hit the jackpot. I claim that if you find such a point, then you can finish the job very easily. What you do is, if you find this point X bar, you simply take a grid of points like this in the X2 variable, and then this, which I call a star configuration, right? I only sample here. These samples would determine F2. These samples would determine F1. But if I hit a point where it's zero, this doesn't work, right? So my problem, you can boil it down to, is I need to find a point where F of X bar is not zero. So let's say that's your problem. You're given this function, it's this tensor business. How do you find just one point where it's not zero? Where should you sample? Some people would say, well, I'll do it randomly. I'll just sample on randomly. It must work, right? Random. I mean, it sounds good, right? It should work. But then you have to put a stochastic model on your, your signals rather than a deterministic model. I have a deterministic model. My functions are tensors and CS, rank one tensors. Well, there is a way to do this, to, 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 to sample, to find an economical way to sample in d dimensions, which I can only write in two dimensions, so there's an economical way to do this, and I'm going to describe it to you now. So the economical way is to use what's called discrepancy points. Now, many of you may know discrepancy points that occurs in high dimensional integration, right? Uh, sometimes called halt, well, one of the constructions of, of, of uh, discrepancy points are 
called the Halton points. You use number theory to construct this configuration of points. So I want to tell you what this configuration of points looks like. So this is the good configuration of points for tensor products. What it looks like <coughs> is you're going to have a bunch of points here, okay? They're going to be scattered around. But the main property they should have is that if you took any rectangle, and if it missed all these points, so you want these points sort of to be spread around in a nice way, if it missed all these points, here's a rectangle and it misses all of them, then the area of this rectangle in the two-dimensional case, the volume in d-dimensions, right, should not, will not exceed 1 over n. That's the property you want. So the way you can construct such a sequence is you can use base 2 and base 3 in two dimensions, base 2 representations, base 3 representations, and basically for every point here you'll pick one point, one point along this line, so this will be an x1, this will be some y, y will not be at y1, and then when you go to x2 will be another point, when you go to x3 you get another point, and, but these scatter around, they move around, or it's a way related to number theory, and it guarantees you this hyper rectangle property. Okay, so there is a configuration. The configuration is given by discrepancy theory, or a specific way is to take these Halton points. And if you use these, then what you can prove is the following, that if you do the sampling at these points, and if the value of the function is zero at every one of those points, then the function is small. You're done. If you don't get a point x bar where f of x bar is non-zero, you're, you're still okay. Because now the function is, is very close to zero. So the, the, the sampling strategy is I sample until I get non-zero, but if I don't get non-zero, I'm still okay because the function will be small. So that's this tensor product case. Okay, so I just tried to <coughs> illustrate, you know, you can take any model you want for your functions, and then the problem is, what's the configuration of points I should sample at for this model? I would like to understand if there are some general principles to do this sampling, and I'll get to that in a moment. You know, do I have to treat each model class separately and think of, okay, what does tensor product tell me and how to do it? Or can I see some systematic way of doing it? All right. So anyway, this gives you the, the, the right accuracy for the, the, the number of samples. If the function is in CS, you'll get accuracy n to the minus s, regardless of whether you find a point where it's non-zero. Okay, now I want to turn to the more difficult or you know, more intellectually challenging problem. Suppose our function is Banach space value. So mapped into a Banach space x. And if we have any hope, we need that the range of f is compact, okay, or else you can't obviously do anything. So whatever model you put on the function should have the property that this range is compact. And I ask, okay, given that, is there any hint or you can give me or tell me how I should sample my function f? Now you have the problem that when you take these samples, these points here are going to be points in X in this Banach space, right? And what you're going to want is those points should be good at approximating F of Y. So you should be maybe be able to take those points in some linear combination and be able to approximate F of Y for any other Y. So that's one property you're going to want. The other property, of course, is how you're going to construct this approximation. And that's usually done by some sort of projection method. So we're going to be asking the question, given this, how do we create points like this so that the span of these Banach space vectors is close to any point in this image K? So that's our first problem. And then once we have that, then we say, well, okay, once we have that, how do we construct now a mapping? And that's usually done by some sort of projection. But let's first address, do you understand that we need this property? That the samples we take should be good enough 
that they can approximate every element of K well, because K I'm thinking of as the image of F. So it's the range of F. And so given an F of Y, it'll be an element of K, and all I will have is these values, and I want them to be able to approximate the value of F of Y. Right? Think of functions that f of y is some function and some h zero one and you want the snapshots here to be able to approximate that function well for any sample. Okay, hopefully you captured why we want that. And now I'm going to tell you an amazing uh, strategy that somehow does pretty good. And here's the strategy, it's a greedy strategy. It's going to tell you how you would pick the samples. Now, <clears throat> before I begin, I know that certain smart people in the audience are going to start laughing and say, come on, this can't work numerically. You're stupid. I mean, go on and talk. I'll read my newspaper. But there's no way that this will work numerically, what I'm going to describe to you. But I want to say, au contraire, <laughs> it will in certain settings. And I'll get to that setting in a moment. So you have to have some patience if you're very sharp, very smart, and you say, oh, I don't think this will work. I say, wait a minute. I'll show you how it works a little later. So here's the strategy. I'm going to show you how to pick the points. Here's the way I pick the first point. I look at uh, the norms of all these f of y. So that's my image, right? I look at f of y. This is my function. I look at its range. And I look at the norms of these functions, and I pick the first point to be one that achieves this norm, x0. I'll make some modifications of this algorithm as I go along. But that's my first choice. Now you say, how would, how would you ever find such a point, right? That's your first <coughs> objection. But be patient. Think of this theoretically for now. After I've chosen endpoints, what do I do? I choose the next point. I look and say, okay, I have these endpoints, so I have these, N, N, these elements of the Banach space. I'm going to use them to approximate f of y. So I'll look at the linear space ge generated by them, and I'll ask for what's the worst point, namely what's the worst value of f what's the worst function that's not being captured by the guys I already have. So the worst guy. And that's the one I'll throw in as my next choice. Do you see the greedy idea? That you look at the, the f of x's, these are the guys you want to capture. This is what you have available now to do the capturing. And you say, what, where, where am I doing the worst? And wherever I'm doing the worst, I throw that one in. It's like having, you know, soccer and the guy that's on the other team that's doing the best and he's killing you, you grab him and put him on your team. So I'm <laughs> grabbing this guy who's doing the most damage to me and I put him on my team. So it's a simple greedy strategy. And we call it pure because it w w acts for, for the actual arc max in each case. Now for numerical considerations, it turns out that you need to really weaken this algorithm to make it at least a little bit in the direction of being numerically implementable. And the first way we weaken it is we say, well, we introduce a, a number gamma. You can pick any number gamma. Say gamma is a half <coughs> or a third or whatever you want. And the first choice, we don't require that the value of f at this point is the max, is exactly the max, which the old algorithm required. We only require that it's bigger than one-third times the max. Well, certainly that loosens up things and makes it easier to find such a point, right? Still questioning how am I going to do that, but do you realize that it is weakening the requirement of the point x0 and makes it more amenable to be uh, found, right? Eitan, are you getting a headache from this? Or? Uh, and then we carry on in this way. Once we found the first endpoints, we find the next one again with this gamma. So we don't require that the distance between that and Vn is the max, but just within gamma. So this is called the weak greedy algorithm. And this is actually what's used in reduced basis methods, which I'll explain to you in a moment. 
Okay. Now, you know, when I saw this algorithm, I saw this, I was visiting Paris and Yvonne Madej came into Albert's office, Albert Cohen's office, and began real excitedly explaining all this. And, you know, our experience is that greedy algorithms don't work, and we were very skeptical anything could be done. And so we asked him, well, what can you prove about this? Anybody can come up with an algorithm, but can you prove some result that shows that it's somehow good or it gives reasonable performance? So the way you would try to measure performance is the following. See, in the end, this algorithm creates an n-dimensional space, Vn, right, from these snapshots or samples of f. And then it uses that n-dimensional space to approximate any other value, f of x. And so you could say, well, suppose I took the best n-dimensional space. My algorithm isn't going to give me the best, but as a comparison, let's take the best. That best space is called the Kolmogorov width of K, right? I have this compact set, and I'm just saying, okay, if God told me which, uh, which space to, to use to slice through K, and such that I project onto this space, it gives me the best approximation, that best space is called the Kolmogorov space, and the error you get is called the Kolmogorov width. So that's the benchmark, that's the best you could ever do, is this dn. And you could ask, <coughs> all right, you used your crazy algorithm, this greedy algorithm, how does it compare to the best? I mean, if, it, if it's three times the best, you light up a big cigar, you get that Luigi Bosca wine, and you're, you'll go home. I mean, you've done a terrific job. Well, the comparison they knew was this. Not, not very close to three. <laughs> that is, after little n iterations, if you picked a hundred samples, then the error was c times a hundred times two to the hundred times the width. <laughs> so it's not doing very well compared to the width. Well, they claim that that doesn't hurt them at all because dn, in their applications, dn goes to zero so fast. Exponentially, this doesn't matter. But to a person like me, it matters. I mean, it doesn't look good. And, and you look and you say, this is low-hanging fruit. I'm going to be able to improve this. I mean, just give me 10 minutes and I'm going to improve that estimate. So then you work several days and you find out you can improve this estimate by removing this n. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so you're, left, you're left with 2 to the n. And so you're now totally embarrassed and saying, why, why is this any good? But it turns out that there is something useful that can be said about this algorithm. It's not as bad as you think. And this was done with several people in sort of in separate sessions. And here's the, here's the theorem you can prove about this algorithm. You, you apply this greedy algorithm. Now, if the Kolmogorov width decays like n to the minus alpha, then this algorithm will give you spaces that behave the same. That's great, isn't it? So it's almost optimal if you have polynomial decay of the n width. Where this bad factor n times 2 to the n or 2 to the n comes in is only in a case where dn tends to 0 real, real fast and then this 2 to the n crops up. If dn goes to 0 in a modest way, this does very well. It's almost like uh, the, the optimal space. So this theorem, which is not too difficult to prove, but I think is very enlightening and says that this greedy algorithm is actually quite, quite good. And, and, and there are other versions of this for exponential decay that I won't dwell on. Okay. Now, uh, what I want to do is I, I want to go through this next thing fairly fast just to tell you the idea because I want to get to how you apply this because I, I believe a lot of you will be skeptical that this can be useful. So I'd like to show an application where it is used. So uh, to summarize what the next two or three slides say is they say, look, uh, you can actually do this in any Bonnock space. Maybe I didn't emphasize the fact that these theorems were proved for a Hilbert space. Okay, this theorem was proved for a Hilbert space, 
but you can do it for any Bonnock space. And when you do it for a general Bonnock space, what happens is you get a square root of n in here. So rather than get, well, let's say here. So if the n width behaves like n to the minus alpha, in the Hilbert space we just got n to the minus alpha. Now we get n to the minus alpha plus beta, where beta is like a half. So we lose a little bit in the Bonnock space case. And you can prove that you have to lose a little bit. And for a harmonic analyst or functional analyst, if they're in the room, the reason you lose is exactly connected to what is called the Cotet Snowbar theorem, which says if you take a Cotet Snowbar, you're interested in given a Bonnock space and given an n dimensional subspace, how small can I make the norm of a projection onto that space? And if you're in a Hilbert space, you can project with norm one. If you're in a general Bonnock space, it was a good question for a while. What's the smallest norm of the projection? It turns out to be square root of n, and you can't improve upon that. And that same square root of n is what's appearing in our case. Okay, so, so far, this greedy algorithm that I've told you about looks rather abstract, maybe. Looks not to be too numerical. Let's see why. Look, if you, if you think numerically that you want to find a space Vn and start taking samples, uh, how do you get around this fact? That you must find a sample whose distance from Vn is like the worst distance. Well, how do you do that without taking a lot of samples? Which defeats your whole purpose. You didn't want to take too many samples, <coughs> but you're going to somehow have to take a resolution of this range of f so fine that you know that if you find a guy which is d suitably distant from Vn, it's almost like the worst distance, right? So how are you going to negotiate that? So that's a, that's a, a, a problem, and we're going to see how that gets played out in an application. Well, another issue is, you know, do you have to compute the distance? And what usually happens is you never compute the distance, you find a surrogate for the distance. In PDEs, this is usually a residual estimate. In approximation theory, this is just some bound for the error that you prove separately. So you use a surrogate so that you don't have to find the actual distance. What does a surrogate mean? It means a quantity such that what you compute is within constants of this. Let's say it's certainly going to be bigger than this, but let's say within some constants of, of this, squash between two constants, okay? So that's what you use in, in practice. Uh, all right, best to, to get on to the application. There, there you can see what actually <coughs> happens. So here's the application I want to look at. I want to look at a, a, a parametric family of PDEs. And to make our life simple, we take the simplest case of elliptic equations. So I have a bunch of elliptic equations. What's differing in each equation is the diffusion coefficient here, A. So I have physical domain, X. X is the physical variable. It's not of large dimension. It's two or three, right? But I have these parameters. Why? Now these kind of problems occur when in optimal design. You're trying to design a coffee cup, a automobile engine, whatever you're trying to design, you introduce some parameters, one for the handle, one for the base, this, that, and you end up with a parametric PDE. So why are the parameters? And that's what's high dimensional. So the Y has high dimension. The X is the physical dimension that's low, don't even worry about it. And you have these elliptic equations, so it's like a Laplacian applied to U equal to F. But I have this diffusion coefficient, and that's what changes at each. It's how the material is, is behaving, right, and what I'm designing. <coughs> now what one wants is you want a fast way to solve this, that if somebody comes up with a query Y, you can solve this very fast, a black box solver. So you're doing some optimization problem, Eitan. And in doing the optimization problem, you, you have to call on this 
solver many times for different values of y and you want something that does it very fast online. Okay? So what should you do? You probably know all about reduced basis and I shouldn't uh, pick on you. But Okay, you have the usual ellipticity assumptions and let's get to the, the, the main point. So what is F? F is our solution map. See, given a y, this determines the a, the diffusion coefficient, and then I have the solution u sub a, right? That's the image of f. f of y is this u sub a. So as y runs over parameter space, I get a bunch of solutions. These solutions live in h0, 1, right? Because I had an elliptic problem with zero boundary conditions. <coughs> And we view it as a manifold. <coughs> we view it as some sort of a smooth, in fact it has smoothness. I mean, this is the usual perturbation theory for elliptic problems. If you do an L infinity perturbation, the solutions don't change very much. So it's a smooth manifold in H01. So K is actually a smooth manifold. All right. Uh, The number of variables here, d, if you're doing a typical parametric problem, d is finite, but if you're doing a stochastic problem, what you do when you're doing a stochastic problem, John, pay attention here, you do what? You expand the diffusion coefficient into a Wiener chaos expansion. Actually. Okay, that's the connection. That's why you invited me here to, to say that. I was wondering what you were going to Yeah. Wiener chaos expansion, and then you get an infinite number of parameters, which are the coefficients in that expansion. Okay, do I get an extra 50 cents for that? Ten dollars an hour. <coughs> okay, <laughs> this is the max, huh? Yeah. All right, so let's say, you know, this is your problem. You want a fast solver, for, right? Given a query, why solve? very fastest equation, this diffusion equation with y as the parameter. Well, you could say, wait a minute, I, I don't want to do anything. I'll just apply an off-the-shelf PDE solver, elliptic PDE solver, like an adaptive method. How would it perform? So I don't do anything. I don't try to take advantage of the smoothness of the mantle. I don't do anything. What will happen is this will perform at a rate n to the minus beta where beta is the smoothness of the u, and s connected to the smoothness of f, and s usually small. Okay, that's going to be small. If f is an L2, beta will be like 1 or something. So that's, so that means with n computations online, you would get this accuracy. What these reduced basis methods are going to give you with n computations online, accuracy capital N to the minus 100 or something very fast. Okay? That's the whole idea. So the second pr approach, which is what I'm interested in, this reduced basis approach, tries to exploit the smoothness of this manifold. And what does it say it's going to do? It says what I want to do is look at this manifold and I'll sample it at some point. And then I'll sort of do an interpolation through those samples. So give me another y, I'll do some sort of an interpolation. Y would correspond to a point here. I sort of, you know, average the, these nearby values or do some sort of a smooth interpolation to this manifold. And now, because the manifold hopefully is very smooth, and indeed it is, I will get a very high accuracy. But the question is, where should I sample? What would be a good configuration to sample in order to achieve this. By the way, once you've picked the samples, if you're interested in approximation in H01, there's only one way to go and that's to use the Galerican projection onto the space spanned by them because that's the best subspace. You with me? Okay. So, so how does the reduced basis uh, program materialize? You have two components to it. There's an offline component and an online component. The offline component is to create this black box. And you take the philosophy, okay, you can take a, a week, a month to prepare 
for this problem and compute this box, this black box solver. But what you want to have happen is when you're given a query that online, very fast, in an optimization technique, you can very fast compute the solution online to this problem. So, offline, online. Here you can spend a lot of time and money. Here it has to be very fast. And what we're going to look for is, okay, we, we we're willing to spend time in the offline stage to find good samples, they call them snapshots, good snapshots of this manifold with the idea that once we find them then we'll be able to build an online solver that's very fast. You following it? Yeah? Okay. A lot of stuff is slipped under the rug in this uh, subject, offline versus online. What is offline? You know, how much are you willing to spend offline? Oh, a week. You know, what does that mean to a mathematician? What does it mean a week? How many? Yeah, so a lot of that is a little nebulous. Now I want to explain, okay, let's, so far I described this for any parametric model. Now I'm going to get specific and I'm going to tell you what A looks like, the diffusion coefficients look like. And I'm going to take this model for the diffusion coefficients and then explain to you in this case what it all works out to be. So this is an affine model. So I assume that every diffusion coefficient can be written in this form as a sum of some functions, y, uh, psi j, with co some coefficients y j. And I'll normalize things so that the y j will always take values between minus 1 and 1. I can just change the, the norm of psi j, right? Multiply psi j by a constant and get this requirement on the y j's. Now, this is what you would get if you did a, a stochastic Wiener chaos expansion of a random diffusion coefficient. You would get such a representation in whatever basis you choose, a wavelet basis, Fourier, Cohen and Leuve, you would get such an expansion. So that's how stochastic processes can be embedded into this. Okay. Uh, now what's going to be critical in all this, and, this and, and the point I'm going to try to make in this thing, because I'm trying to tell you when can you do these high dimensional problems. It's going to turn out that it's going to depend on how fast these norms of these psi j's to tend to zero. So I can always rearrange the coefficients so that the psi j's in L infinity, their norms are decreasing. And how fast they tend to zero is going to be a critical issue. Now look back up here, it tells you if the psi j is small, it means that it has little influence, right? It's the weakness of that variable. The variables now are the y j's. That, that variable has little influence on, on the problem if the norm of psi j is small, right? So that's where the fact that the variables are not democratic plays an important role. So variable reduction is taking place here because we'll impose some sort of condition on this. Okay, so where can you take the samples? Uh, well, by the way, okay, you, we're going to want to take do greedy sampling. So we're going to have this and we're going to somehow use a, a greedy sampling to find our good reduced basis. I'll get to that in a moment. But before we begin, we can say well, what is the n width of this class? So, if I start with this diffusion coefficient, compute the solution for this, look at the family of all solutions as y varies over minus 1, 1 to the d, how smooth is that manifold? Because the smoothness of that manifold is going to govern how well I can do with any method. What's the Kolmogorov width of that manifold? And so the first thing I want to tell you about is a result that's not easy to prove at all. Uh, with uh, Albert and Chris Schwab, and it says that <coughs> in, if the norms of these guys, remember they have to tend to zero. If they tend to zero fast enough that they're in little LP, and P is less than one. So for example, if they tend like uh, n to the minus 3, then they would be in roughly in L one third, right? If the coefficients went to 0 or j to the minus 3, it would be roughly in 
L one third, right? Eton, one over n is sort of the boundary of where convergence occurs, right? A little faster than one over n, it's going to convert. All right, <clears throat> so this is a quantitative theorem that says, look, before you begin, I'll tell you, 